What up, what up? Welcome on into Inside Baylor Sports, the official daily podcast of Baylor Athletics. On today's show, we're talking Baylor softball, Baylor track and field, Jacoby Walter declaring for the NBA draft, and also our Baylor acrobatics and tumbling team picking up the number one seed for nationals, which begins next week. All that and more coming up on the show. Don't forget, you can catch Inside Baylor Sports every weekday. You can also watch the video version for free over at BaylorPlus.com. And on the Baylor Athletics YouTube channel, like, subscribe, rate, and review the pod. And follow Baylor Plus today on X, Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. It's the official content network of Baylor Athletics. Think Netflix for your Baylor Bears. Download the app on your mobile device and sign up for your free seven-day trial today at BaylorPlus.com. It's Tuesday, April 16th, 2024. Justin Hoff alongside the Baylor Bear insider, Jerry Hill. Jerry, let's begin with Jacoby Walter. Jacoby Walter... Uh, No shocker here. We expected him to declare for the NBA draft. He's now the second player in as many weeks that has done it. Eve Misi last week, Jacoby Walter now officially in the draft. Yeah, and I think you had said, didn't you, Justin, that uh, Baylor's never had two first rounders in the same NBA draft? Until this year. That's what I'm saying. Like, I think it should happen this year. Like, with Jacoby and Eve both in there, um, you know, and I know – some fans are disappointed they're leaving, but you know what? Um, this is their dream. This is what they wanted to do. And if they can do it in a year, I say go. You know, I mean, they're both going to be, I think, first round draft picks. I think Jacoby will be a lottery pick or should be. Um, and Eve certainly will go first round. So, yeah, I I think it's great for recruiting, um, you know, and, and, and both of those guys played really well this year. I mean, you could, you could say – um, you know, I, I think probably if not the best two, two of the best three or four players in the program this year. So, and two of the best freshmen of all time, I would say. So, yeah, I, I think it's great. Um, you know, I, I think Jacoby, you know, could either one of them or could both of them, you know, benefit from another year. Sure. But I think they're both ready for, to make that next jump. And certainly the NBA folks think they're ready. Yeah, and if you watch the experts and kind of if you're following on uh, X and if you look at the mock drafts, a lot of them are saying that this NBA draft may be one of the weaker overall drafts. So if you were on the fence about going, this is probably a year where you go because it's not really, you know, a top heavy draft. Some drafts you have clear cut like top five. It's not really that case this year. And so. I think for these two, a really good decision. Hey, if you can get uh, pretty much a guarantee and a first-round draft pick, you're going. I don't care where you are, who you are, you're probably going in the NBA. So kudos to these guys. And and remember this, they played at Baylor, and so they're going to carry that with them. We'll see them around. We'll see them at games at the Foster. We'll see them back at Vet Week. They're still going to be part of the program just because you don't see them, you know, wearing the Baylor jersey and playing in March Madness doesn't mean they're not part of the family in the program. With Coach Drew, he keeps these guys around the program. So we're going to continue to see these guys just like Keontae George. I'm sure he'll be back this summer. Had a great uh, rookie season campaign in the NBA. And you think about guys like, you know, Jeremy Sohan, Keontae George, Eve Misi, Jacoby Walter. The list can go on and on. But we're starting to knock on the door of of players, what, uh, you know, more than 10. Uh, double figures and there's going to be some all-stars there's going to be some guys out of this group that will eventually be an NBA all-star and I cannot wait for that time yeah and I mean based on this last year the the rookie year that Keontae has had I think he's kind of on that path Justin I mean you know I know it was um, you know not for a great team or anything but uh, he he put up great numbers and he has flashes of just absolute you know, brilliant. So, you know, he's a guy that could, but, you know, there's other guys in the league that, like you said, I think uh, a day is coming when we're going to have maybe even multiple guys in the NBA all-star game. And I think that's a great thing. Uh, And like you said, just the numbers. I mean, I can remember a time when the, the number of Baylor players in the NBA was zero. So now we're looking up and, you know, we're about to be double digits and, you know, and like you said, there's guys starting, there's guys playing really well. Um, you know, I, I think I saw a note uh, that Royce O'Neal has made the playoffs every year that he's been the NBA. Congrats to Royce. Um, so, yeah, just another guy out there in the NBA that's that's doing it really well. 
Yeah, and that's uh, man, that's a great note, Jerry. That's a good nugget right there. That's that's a winner, and he always was right. He was those intangible kind of player, you know, him and Ish Wainwright. We think about the last decade. I think about guys that were best intangible players. I would say Royce, Ish, Mark Vital. Those three, and two of those three have been living in the NBA for the last uh, several years. And Royce O'Neal has made himself a, a great career, right? He did not get drafted, went over to Europe, kind of fine-tooled, you know, re uh, find his game, if you will, and then came back to the States and has just been too good of a player to keep off an NBA roster. I mean, he's played on multiple teams and just been a shutdown, lockdown, kind of a 3 and D kind of guy. And so uh, that's been big. But, yeah, looking forward to it. This season, Baylor had nine players in the NBA. So these two off, very likely to be 10-plus. We'll still wait to, to hear the news on Jalen Bridges and what happens there. He's got the COVID year, but, mm -hmm. you know, uh, last year he obviously uh, uh, put his name in, and we'll see what happens there for Jalen Bridges, a potential second-round draft pick to most mock drafts right now. All right, let's move over to Baylor softball. It was a busy weekend this past weekend for them. Um, had the uh, kind of the duel, the, the, the split games with Texas, if you will, the Friday game in Waco and then two games there in Austin. And Jerry didn't go the way they wanted it to, obviously uh, getting swept here, 14 to, a, 14 to 1, six innings on Friday night, 9-6 loss on Saturday and a 9-5 loss on Sunday. But Coach Glenn Moore did say he really liked his team's kind of resolve and the fact that they competed. And we saw that both those games were nationally televised on the weekend. I know I was watching that Saturday game and got off to a nice lead there early and uh, just, just going up against the number one team in the country in Texas and that Texas team, man, they're really good this year. Yeah. I mean, Glenn said, this is the best Texas team that he's seen. And you think about that. I mean, they've had, you know, four conference champions. They've been to the world series uh, five times in his era. So this is a, you know, and they've been to the super regional. If they make it this year, this would be the fifth consecutive year of a potential tournament that they would have made a super regional. So this is a really good Texas team. Uh, they rank number one in at least, you know, one of the polls, several polls, I think. Um, but yeah, I, you know, the way that they responded, Justin, I think was the big thing, you know, 14 one that opening night here in Waco and it just, it got ugly and kept getting uglier. And, you know, you could tell Glenn was pretty, disappointed, frustrated uh, after that game Friday night. And, you know, he just wanted to see how this team would respond. And I think they did respond. Like you said, they jumped out to a three nothing lead in that top of the first inning on Saturday and really, you know, competed with him kind of went toe to toe on Saturday. And, you know, um, Sunday was not maybe as consistently like right there with them. Um, but, you know, had a, you know, had a second inning lead three to two and uh, fell behind nine, three and kept fighting. You know, they're, they're down to their last at bat. They're down to their last, you know, strike last out. Um, and they're fighting, you know, they, they score two on a, a Casey West single in that seventh inning and make it nine, five. So, uh, you know, and, and had runners, two runners in scoring position, second and third with two outs. And, you know, I know this is a little bit of a stretch, but I think I even put it in the story you brought the potential tying run to the on deck circle. I don't know that that's necessarily a thing, but you know, that's how close they were. I mean, and, and again, this is the number one team in the nation and, and what Glenn Moore thinks is the be best Texas softball team in his time, in his 24 years at Baylor. Yeah. Right now, Texas, they look better than Oklahoma. They do. Right? Yeah, they, they defeated uh, Oklahoma in that series, Jerry. And Man, Texas. I really look at the Olympic sports. I know they were good at women's basketball this year. Obviously, uh, it's been a it's been a stellar year for Texas, and uh, you know they've uh, they've been really strong in in a lot of the sports and Olympic sports. The last couple of years have been really strong, and they're up there at the top of, of pretty much everything. Baseball. I know they're having a, a tough go of it, but softball team really strong right now for Texas. So uh, we'll keep an eye on them. Uh, Baylor softball. They're back in action tonight at Getterman Stadium, taking on UT Arlington. It's an interesting night. So the baseball team, they head up to Arlington to face the Mavericks. And the softball team welcomes the Mavericks to Waco. Same schools going head-to-head. -head. We don't see that very often, do we? 
occasionally, uh, but it is strange. I mean, sometimes you'll see them playing the same school, you know, both here. Uh, but this is unique in the fact that one is on the road, one is here. Um, and Justin, this begins a stretch. Um, so they have 11 regular season games left, seven at home. So that's big. You know, this is the first of a four game home stand for softball. So, uh, and I think, you know, looking at that schedule, I think they've got a chance. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say they win every game, but they've got a chance because that's a very favorable schedule the rest of the way. And if they could, you know, let's say they win nine. Um, and, you know, and those are, uh, you know, other than I guess maybe what one, two, well, Utah is is out of conference as well. But let's say they win seven conference games out of nine. Um, that puts you, you know, right around 500. And that's, I think that's what you'd like to do. Um, when you're sitting at five and 13, that's hard to do. Um, but, you know, I guess technically if you won out, you would finish over 500. And I think they have a chance to do that. Like I said, these are all, this is a favorable schedule. They've got the top, what, probably four or five teams in the league out of the way. So this is a more favorable schedule. I know you face the bottom two teams in the league in that stretch. So let's win some games. Let's kind of maybe even boost that RPI a little bit. You know, this strength of schedule will not help them down the stretch, but uh, they, they could definitely rack up some wins in this closing stretch. RPI right now, 21, 21 entering Tuesday. So looking to that number, it's been, you know, as high as like eight or nine, you know, early in the season, 22 and 17, as Jerry said, a 22 and 17 overall, but as Jerry said, five and 13 in big 12 play. And so, yeah, with 11 games left, you'd love to see them get to that 30 win mark in the regular season before they get to postseason. And so UT Arlington tonight at home, and then you have UCF coming into town this weekend. And that's going to be exciting, Jerry, because one, obviously UCF uh, new to the conference and, and kind of welcoming them here, but also honoring the 2014 Baylor softball team. Of course, that team went to the World Series. And of course, they had that big win over Kentucky. Yeah. And uh, anytime Baylor's beating Kentucky these days, we'll take that, right, Jerry? Absolutely. And I was there for that one. That was an unbelievable comeback. Uh, you know, I'm, I remember Glenn talking about it after that, uh, you know, I think he had gone up to tie his son who was probably maybe 12 or something at that time. And he was trying to console him, you know, like this was going to be their, you know, last, this was going to knock them out of the tournament and they were going to go home and he was trying to go up to tie and console him. And Ty was like, what are you talking about? We're going to win this game. Ty was more confident than Glenn Moore that the Bears were going to come back and win. And sure enough, they did. Man, what a great game. Uh, you know, just an unbelievable comeback. And at that point, I don't know if it's been exceeded since then, Justin, but that was the greatest comeback in the Women's College World Series history. And, you know, just a great win. Um, you know, they finished tied for third. I guess it would have been in 11 and 14 uh, but man, that was that was a fun one that day uh, against Kentucky, and that's that's a great team to recognize. You know, obviously Whitney Canyon was the ace pitcher, but uh, a lot of talent on that team, so it'll be good to welcome them back. Yeah, and uh, Jordan Strickland, uh, Holly Hall. I mean, a lot of a uh, lot of really talented players looking up and down that roster, and I just love when you welcome back these these old teams. Uh, I love that. You know, I think. There's just a part of it that us as fans, you get into the here and now and watching this group, but it's always about those those teams that, you know, paved the way, pay the way for the others. And so I'm always about honoring the past and loving to see this 2014 uh, coming to uh, back to Getterman, back to Getterman. It looks a little bit different. Uh, updated that video board since then, so that's uh, that's good news. But Baylor track and field, also a big weekend for them. It's the green and gold weekend. We know baseball's in action. We know softball, track and field, and also the uh, green and gold spring game over at McLean at 12 o'clock on Saturday. But the Michael Johnson Invitational, that's always a big one, Jerry. And for Baylor track and field, been busy. Uh, been busy lately, uh, whether it was LSU to Florida, where they've been competing these last couple weeks. Yeah, and it was funny. They they kind of split this past week, and the distance crew went west to California to compete in the Brian Clay Invitational, and the rest of the team all went east to Gainesville, Florida, com to compete in the Tom Jones Invitational. And 
And I'm assuming this is not the Tom Jones that I remember growing up listening to singing. I'm guessing this is somebody that's actually affiliated with track, but I have not had a chance to research that or look that up. But could uh, be the same guy. Never know. <laughs> I'm I'm thinking not. I don't know why Florida would name their invitational after Tom Jones, but maybe he went to school there. I don't know. They could have named it the Burt Reynolds Invitational, right? I mean, he was a big Florida guy. Or no, he was Florida State. That's right. He was Florida State. Smokey and the Bandit. That's all I know. What's that? Smokey and the Bandit. That's all I know with Burt. He, no, he actually played football at Florida State. I believe he was a quarterback there. So anyway, some great performances uh, in Gainesville this past weekend. Freshman Molly Haywood, um, she won the Women's Invitational pole vault. They, they, this is one of those meets where they have some open, you know, college only. They have an Olympic development group, and then they have the Invitational where, you know, they're trying to get some of the top, you know, competitors in that event. And she won the Women's Invitational pole vault with an outdoor personal best of 14, four and three quarters. And Nathaniel Ezekiel broke his own program record in the 400 meter hurdles, finishing third overall in 48, 29. The winner um, that day was Alabama's Chris Robinson, the 2023 NCAA champion won in 47.95, only the seventh sub 48 second race in NCAA uh, division one history. So a couple of great performances there. Also Zaza, Namde, he he returned. This was his first collegiate action of the year, and he finished second behind 2022 NCAA champion Mark Minicello with a mark of 258-10 uh, in the javelin throw. And Florida transfer, program record holder, and recent Sikkim podcaster Alexis Brown was fifth in the women's invitational long jump with a mark of 21 two and a half, the eighth best mark in program history. And like I said, on the on the distant side, um, out west in California, Ryan Hodge, graduate student Ryan Hodge, ran the seventh fastest 10,000 meter in school history with a 30.02.04, a little faster than Jerry Hill could ever run 10,000 meters in. Yeah, in the women right now, top 20 team, top 20 right now, 19th in the country. So those rankings and those teams continue to uh, to work. Alexis Brown, uh, yeah, that was a nice uh, promo there. Uh, Jerry for the Sikkim podcast. All right, let's finish it off with acrobatics and tumbling. They're the one seed. Big shocker, Jerry. One seed again, going for national title number nine next week. Yeah, and here's the thing. Yeah, they're the one seed. And, and you know, yeah, we're, we're joking that it's shocking because – when you're the eight-time defending champion, you're 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 going to be the number one seed, and unless you just don't get it done in the regular season, of course they're undefeated in the regular season. I believe they have a 35 or 36 meet, you know, consecutive winning streak going. Uh, but here's the thing: they're the number one seed. They're facing the eighth seed. Guess who the eighth seed is? Fairmont State. Guess where the meet is being held? Fairmont State. So that's your that's your gift for being the number one seed. You get to play the host team at their school. Uh, in the uh, quarterfinals in the first round of of nationals. Well, you know, I'm going to be there and I'm going to be happy about that. Not in the same city as Jerry Hill. I need a break from you, but I'll still see you on the podcast there for uh, a couple of days. But yeah, that's uh, Thursday, the quarterfinals, Baylor against Fairmont State, seven o'clock meet number four. And if you look at the seeds, Baylor, number one, Quinnipiac, number two, Gannon, three, Oregon, four, Mary Harden, Baylor, five, Azusa, Pacific, six, Frostburg State, seven, and Fairmont State, eight. Oregon, number four, a little surprising. And for them, you know, they've been uh, trying to be up there number two these last couple of years, though. They haven't been number two all the time. And give credit to Quinnipiac and Gannon who are jumping them some. Yeah, I remember the meet with Gannon. I mean, that one was uh, that. I think that's the closest one of the year, right? And and Fee even said then, you know, this is the this is the second best team. Um, you know, so I think Quinnipiac and Gannon have kind of earned that spot as being two three in the nation right now. But uh, again, so you go from Fairmont State and potentially, you know, you get through that one, and then potentially you would face Oregon. You know, which won, by the way, four national championships when Fee Mulkey was there and has traditionally been the second best team. So that's who you would get in the semifinals. And, and then, you know, in the finals, you get there and you face, you know, one of those uh, next uh, top two teams, either Quinnipiac or, 
or Gannon. So, and, and Justin, when you were reading those off, I was like, I, cause I had not looked at the full list. UMHB number five. How about that? You know, just down the road, fairly new program. Um, and them being uh, the fifth seed. Um, that's an awesome accomplishment uh, and congrats to the Crusaders because that's 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 a really cool thing with a program that you know started what four or five years ago and now they're sitting there at number five in the nation. So congrats to them as well. Yeah, Gannon and Oregon. We played Oregon twice this year. Gannon once, as Jerry said, that was the closest match, a uh, closest meet. We should say March sixteenth, two seven eight. 0.715 for Baylor, 275.555 for Gannon. So about three points there. That was the closest one and have yet to play Quinnipiac all year. But 8-0 and and looking forward to that trip. Even going back to West Virginia, I, I joked with Coach Fee, I really wanted this out in California. You know, I've been to West Virginia a lot, Jerry. Uh, heck, last year we were in West Virginia, the hills and – and uh, some of those roads, I mean, you're going on some of those roads at night. Uh, there's a lot of potholes in West Virginia. It's a lot of left and right. And if you're not careful, you can't be working on your laptop on those hills. You're getting a little sick. And then before you know it, it's it's too late. Well, so I'm assuming you're like on the bus or something. You're not driving on your laptop, right? You're not, like, you're not well, driving, have- trying to do stuff um, on your laptop. Am mm-hmm. I right? Well, I have done that before, but no, I would not recommend that. But yes, no. I'm on the bus, but I'm saying, yes, the bus ride last year, yeah. West Liberty, it was rough. And and I've lived in Morgantown. Heck, when I lived there in an apartment, it was up on a hill. You had to kind of pray to, to come down the hill uh, when it snowed and the ice and everything. So West Virginia, it's just uh, it's a, sp- uh, a space that's not made for roads, okay? It just isn't. You're literally in the mountains. And so hopefully Fairmont, Fairmont is a little bit more flat than some of those other spots. So uh, looking forward to a good flat road and Baylor acrobatics and tumbling going for the win uh, next week. I know you're going to miss me not being here in Waco, right? Mm -hmm. A little bit. Uh, Sure. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's go with that. Uh, And Fairmont, we might say too, I can't remember if you were there or not, but this was the site of the very first uh, one that Baylor won with Coach Fee back in 2015. So they returned to that site uh, that they won their very first national championship. So that's a kind of a cool thing uh, to come full circle to be back there at Fairmont State to try to win another one. I was not there, but I have seen the video footage and have worked with it some. Jalen Bridges, of course, from Fairmont, uh, West Virginia. So maybe we'll see him back there. Maybe he'll come out for one of these. But uh, that'll do it for today's edition of Inside Baylor Sports, a sport and story production. Thanks for listening. For Jerry Hill, I'm Justin Hoff. Have a great Tuesday and sick em bears. Sick em bears.